So it's a pleasure for me and a great honour to be talking at the Royal Society. So thank you for this opportunity to present to you some of the research that we've been doing at RMIT University and over my 20 years of my career, asking the question, livable cities for all, are we there yet? Before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land of which I'm meeting today, the Wurundjeri and people of the Kulin Nation, and to acknowledge our elders past and present and emerging leaders, and to acknowledge elders past and present emerging wherever you are across the country. I like to use this map that was being developed by ANU. It's a mapping exercise which they're focused on understanding the languages across the country, the very many languages of the Indigenous people. And I think that's really important because the whole focus of our research is on place and place is so important to Indigenous people. We've been reminded through COVID just how important good city planning is. People who had access to parks nearby, who had shops nearby, were so much more able to live a life uh, that was easy to manage during COVID. And I think this is really sho showcased and provided evidence about just how important where we live is and how important it is for our planning. But we knew this already because there's been in the last couple of decades, this growing concern about this rapid urbanisation that we're experiencing across the globe. Australia is very highly urbanised already. Most people live in cities, but also population growth. This is a major concern across the globe. By 2050, our, our population will be expanding, but 68% of our population is going to be living in cities, which makes cities a very important place for us to think carefully about that. Now, the UN has also picked this up, of course, and they've got now in the UN Sustainable Development Goals, thinking through, uh, it's got goal 11, which is focused on sustainable cities and settlements. But actually, if you look across the whole of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, there's about nine goals and 24 targets that really speak to this issue of city planning and health. So it's recognised globally that this is important. Now, I know we've had a hiccup in our immigration for the time being, but whether it's 2050 that we're going to reach 8 million in Melbourne or if it's going to be in 2060, we have a problem. Our population is growing, even in highly urbanised countries like Australia. And this calls to us that we need to really think carefully about the way we're planning our cities. Now, that's important because what it meant if we were going to achieve this, by 2050, we're going to need to build an extra 1.6 million new residences. It's putting pressure on our resources and our infrastructure. We cannot continue to grow our cities, even if they are electric cars, the way we're doing it, because traffic congestion is very expensive. The Infrastructure Australia has estimated that it's rising costs by 2030 under a business as usual model, not changing the way we build our cities, but just the way we're planning our cities now. It's going to cost $53 billion a year just for productivity losses because of traffic congestion. So we really need to think about it, even if it's an electric car, that's not going to solve the problem. Now, why did we start to get involved in the whole notion of livability? It's a buzzword, something very popular in Melbourne, but the reason why I got involved in the concept of livability is because of this man, Ian Butterworth, Dr. Ian Butterworth, who at the time when I first came to Melbourne was working in the northwest region of Melbourne, where four of six growth areas, so rapid population growth, going on in these areas and he was very concerned about what was, going, what was going on and he asked me even before I came to Melbourne which was 10 years ago whether I would get involved in his his area and his uh, this topic of place and health and this is what he, the challenge he gave to me let me share with you just his thoughts about what he wanted me to do We need conclusive evidence that shows the relationship between ur good urban planning uh, and making it easy for people to experience exercise as part of their everyday lives. Not just exercise, but also access to good places, access to healthy food, access to great public transport that's reliable, affordable, uh, frequent, um, integrated with other forms of transport. Um, we need to make sure that people have got good access to local parks, uh, fresh food outlets, entertainment, leisure, um, friends and family, or at least transportation options to get there. That, that information needs to be taken up not only by health people, but in particular by developers and by people that manage urban planning portfolios. Ultimately, we want to influence the, the policy and legislative environment that makes it imperative for any urban development proposal to show that it links into 
best practice and the evidence base to support that. No pressure. Quite a big agenda that Ian presented to me, uh, but he was working in the health, the health department in the Northwest region where the growth was massive, the problems were large, and he was provided me with a challenge. What he's talking to me about in public health, these are the social determinants of health. It's not to do with disease, it's to do with the social determinants that create the conditions for good or bad health. And in fact, if the, the definition of the social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live and age, and the wider forces and systems that shape daily living. And the sorts of things that he was talking about was exactly those sorts of things. So that's a real challenge. Now, if I talk to the Minister for Transport or the Minister for Planning, I'm not convinced that he was, they're going to be very particularly interested in the social determinants of health, unfortunately, because it's really critical, creates the conditions for good or poor health. But the question for me and the opportunity to arise is, could we reframe the social determinants of health through the lens of livability? Because livability was something that was very valued in the policy arena in Victoria, in Melbourne, and so we decided that we would create a definition of livability that included these social determinants of health because it was such a valued concept. And so I talked to the Minister for Transport about, um, about livability and the role that transport can play in creating a livable city. It's much more appealing to him or her, uh, as it is now, um, than it was if I talked about the social determinants of health. When I think of really livable cities, you know, I think of places that are a little bit smaller, I suppose, but, you know, things like Copenhagen, where, you know, it's beautiful. There's, they really embrace cycling and the scale is very manageable. They're starting to get a higher rise now, but, you know, until relatively recently, they've, you know, four to six storey high buildings. Um, they ha it's quite compact development. It's, you know, very high quality standard of living. Um, and to me, that's very livable. One could think of Barcelona and think, well, that's a terrific city. Now, the problem with Barcelona, of course, is they've got air quality and noise problems because they haven't managed the traffic. So one has to really, if you want to have a compact city, which I think we need from a global perspective, one also has to manage traffic. Can't just have compact, otherwise it's high-rise sprawl. So it's really important that we're thinking about combining land use with transport and that's why we call for this idea of integrated planning because unless you've got land and transport being done together you end up with perverse outcomes um, and it's really really important. Now before I start I'd really like to acknowledge a huge team of people who have contributed to this research and all of our funders because it wouldn't have been possible without this huge team of people working on this. It's been over about a uh, well, 10 years now that we've been working on these sorts of concepts and we've had a significant funding from the NHMRC through a Centre for Excellence in Healthy Livable Communities and also um, through the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre and we also had funding through the Department of Environment from uh, Clean Air and Urban Landscape Hub uh, of, the, uh, of the NEST program. So I want to acknowledge them because it wouldn't be possible without them. Now the first task that we had uh, was to really ask the question, well, what is livability? Well, how do we measure that and wh what is it actually? Because we, people talk about it, but they don't really define it. And lots of people talk about it in different ways. So we took the view that we'd look at the literature and find out what people said. So we came up with this very comprehensive definition. So we said a livable community is one that is safe and socially cohesive and inclusive. It has to be environmentally sustainable. It has affordable housing and diverse housing, but it's no point providing affordable housing on the fringe of cities if it's not linked by public transport, walking and cycling infrastructure, to employment, to all the services that you need for daily living. So our definition of livability was very comprehensive because that's what makes a place livable, that people are able to get around their daily life, not by having to drive everywhere, but by, by using alternative transport, more sustainable mobility. Um, and they do need to have affordable housing, but it's not affordable when people are running two or three cars uh, because they can't get to any services except but to drive. Now we took the view, it was all very well to do a you know, definition, it was a nice literature review, we got lots of citations because people thought it was great. But the question is, we took the view that what will get measured will get done because that's the way that life works. And we started to ask the question, are we creating livable city for all? And when thinking about this, I was reminded of this really important article. It came out in 2009, and I didn't want to be anyone saying this to me. So the idea, if you wanted to have your research 
to influence policy and practice, which we did, uh, we were asked by a policymaker to engage in this research, is to make sure that the studies were policy relevant. Because we didn't want to get accused by our planning and transport collaborators, tell us something that we don't already know or do. And this was a response of planning and transport professionals to public health guidance on the built environment and physical activity. So this was a study that was done, published in 2009, when these academics went around uh, to ask them about what they thought of public health guidance on, pu on built environment and physical activity. So the last thing I wanted was to be told, tell us something that we don't already know and do. So that was really clear in my mind. We wanted to be, make something that was really important. Now, in order to do that, if you want to change the policy world, which we did and we do, you have to understand the policy environment in which we're working. So what are we trying to influence? What's the policy world we're trying to influence? And how can we change that? So the starting point for us was doing the literature review. And then I had a couple of PhD students, Melanie Lowe, who did a work looking at state government policy. And then Jeff Brown, he looked at local government policy. And then we also did policy analysis across the country. That came a little later. I'm going to talk to you about that. So policy analysis is really important. What's the policy environment we're trying to influence? The next thing, you know, we're academics. It's got to be an exciting scientific enterprise. No point just doing policy relevant research which isn't exciting from an academic point of view and going to make a contribution to science. So we wanted to do that. And Hannah Badland led this work. We started to unpack and we thought, well, what are the sort of domains of livability? We said it was public access to public open space, access to public transport, how walkable a neighbourhood is. So when we measure walkability, we're thinking about the density, how connected the street networks are and whether there's shops and services nearby. So that's walkability, how affordable the housing is, whether people have access to employment, uh, whether they have a supportive food environment, so they have access to supermarkets. And we also put in alcohol environment. Um, this was something that one of our industry partners, our funders, wanted to, us to measure, so we measured that as well. So here we were looking at what are the health impacts of living environments with these, what we call the d different domains of livability, the things that make up a, a livable community. You might notice actually that we haven't measured sustainability. That was one area that we haven't done yet. I'm hoping to do that in the future. It's an interesting question about whether or not, um, you know, it's good to have ac access to alcohol nearby or not. Our indicator of uh, was actually is having it further away was better than actually having it close by. But of course, there is this um, important element of socialising and, and having access to um restaurants and cafes and things that sell alcohol for from a you know from a recreational point of view it does provide opportunities for recreating but if it's only that's the only choice that people have it's probably not great for people's health and well-being so here we were our primary question lots of papers that came out are the underlying domains of livability associated with health and well-being? And Hannah led an amazing program of work where we looked at all these different domains of livability and published lots of papers confirming that, indeed, there are associations. The measures, are, the, the measures of the built environment we created were all policy relevant, so it spoke to policy, but there, we also wanted to identify which of these were most associated with health, and she led this incredible program. Yeah, I think people are very different throughout the world and that's a challenge in terms of um, how things are implemented on the ground in different cities. But most people need to have access to a school. They mo most people need access to doctors, however it's described in a different country. Uh, most people need access, if we want people to walk, they need a walkable community with somewhere to walk to. But the how it looks in a place may differ, but in some ways the metrics are somewhat similar because people everywhere will need those things. What we've argued in our Lancet series, which we did, we published in 2016, is how it's delivered on the ground may vary. The underlying principles of what's needed is the same. And we have got um, in our new series that's coming out, there's a new series, a Lancet series coming out, hopefully next year, we have a paper where um, one of the papers has compared uh, what creates walkability in different cities in you know, 11 countries. Same thing's come out. And we've actually worked out what the thresholds for those um, will be. So that's an exciting sort of development where we'll be looking at you know, how much density optimises the outcomes beyond which you know, too much density actually discour might discourage people from being active. Well, how close should public transport be to encourage people to walk? So we've actually got metrics for that. 
So I think that's going to be quite an exciting development because it's probably the first time that you've got a global study trying to work out what the metrics should be for a city uh, and, and in very different environments, you know, from Hong Kong through to, you know, Phoenix type of thing, you know, it's very different cities in across the globe. The second question that we wanted to ask, which came later after we'd done all that, is are there spatial variations in access to health-promoting amenities in Melbourne or health-promoting environments? Was there variation in these domains? And so we wanted to look at that. So the first thing we did was looked at Melbourne's, this is just the Melbourne's, we've got data for this nationally. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Melbourne's walkability. And you see a very clear pattern here. You can see in the Centre of Melbourne, or very much in the, you know, if we're looking at the graph here, this is the deciles of walkability. This is the most walkable area. What we tend to find is if you're anything from six and below, you're not likely to walk, you're more likely to drive. And you can see that obviously in the inner Melbourne, uh, beautiful grid patterns that we created in the, you know, in the, when Melbourne was first created by Europeans, you can see that we've got a nice walkable grid lovely and then even in the middle suburbs not too bad but once you start to get out to the outer suburban areas lots of pink very low walkable areas where you expect that everyone's driving so we've created a city that is for people in the city that can walk if they choose uh, but to people who live in the outer suburban areas generally have to drive everywhere we also had measures of social infrastructure we looked about 16 different types of social infrastructure whether people have access to a school whether they've got you know, gp surgeries nearby whether they've got supermarket all these sorts of different types of social infrastructure and we looked at again what's the pattern across the city and we find a similar pattern that in the inner city uh, where, where it's nice and green we see that or even in the middle level suburbs it's really terrific lots of access to social infrastructure in fact 12 to nearly 14 different types of social infrastructure people have access to within a walkable catchment of their home. But if you're living out in the fringe, the pink areas, some of those people are living out in the fringe with zero to 1.4 different types of social infrastructure, not much access at all. So of course, what that means is that people have to drive everywhere. So a bit of a problem. So the third question that we wanted to um, address in our research was does the concept of urban livability affect health and well-being? And to do that, we wanted to provide an alternative way of looking at the livability index. This is developed by the Economist Intelligence Unit. It's something that we speak about a lot in Melbourne because Melbourne is one of the most livable cities in the world and we always value that. But actually, the index that was developed by the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit is to actually decide what the load-in should be for executives who are moving to Melbourne. That's what it's for. That's actually what it's for. So. Needless to say, we're the most livable city in the world. If you come to Melbourne as an as a expat, you don't get a loading. If you go to some countries, you get a 20% loading because it's not very livable. So we wanted to create a livability index which was about the lived experience of people living in Melbourne. So what we did to do this was work that was done by Carl Higgs. It was a beautiful piece of work. He pulled together all of these different types of measures of livability and put it into an index and mapped that relationship. And lo and behold, you see a similar pattern, as you might expect, to what we've seen with walkability, social infrastructure, and many of the other indicators that we've got. People in the inner city, of course, live in a very livable area. People on the fringe have a much less livable area to live in because they don't have access to amenities and all the things that create health and well-being. So we've been doing a series of studies on this. This is one that I'm going to present on whether people walk and cycle. Uh, and, use, and whether they drive. And what we found, what Carl found and published uh, in 2019, was for every unit increase in urban livability, the likelihood of people walking decreased, walking, cycling, using public transport, increased by about 10 to 15%, and the likelihood of people driving decreased by about 12%. This is pretty important findings because if we want, you saw the figures on congestion, uh, if we want to change the way we build our cities, People having access to this sort of amenity means that they are more likely to walk and cycle and use public transport, less likely to drive, which obviously is much better uh, from a health point of view, but also important from an environmental sustainability point of view. Now, we wanted to take this work nationally. We got funded by uh, the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre and the Clean Air and Urban Landscape to go national. So we've been doing most of our work up until this point in Victoria, in Melbourne, and then we went national. So this work was our Creating Livable Cities report, which we put out in 2017. 
And one of the key questions we wanted to ask in this was, do we have the policy environment or frameworks in place in Australia to deliver healthy livable cities or not? And this is a big important question because we talk about this all the time. We talk about creating livable cities. We talk about creating walkable cities. But do we have the policy frameworks in place to achieve that? And I just want to show you one example of the sorts of policies. Density is clearly really important. If you want to have a walkable city, you've got to get the densities high enough to have enough people to create opportunities for people to walk and cycle to all the shops and services that need to be by. So the densities need to be high enough to be able to achieve a walkable neighbourhood. And what we found was when we did our policy analysis, this is 2016, 2017, and things are changing all the time. But for example, in Melbourne, our policy target was 15 dwellings per hectare, very low density. And that's really important because when we looked at the percentage of suburbs that were achieving it, only 21% of suburbs were even, even though the, the density targets were too low, only 21% of suburbs were actually achieving that level of, of density. And when we look across the policies generally, we don't have the policy frameworks in place in Australia to achieve the cities that we say we want and need. Um, rather, we, we find that the policies are not high enough. And even if there are policies in, and they're too low, they're not being delivered. So 21% of suburbs only, probably the ones in the inner city, that get up to a policy target of 15 dwellings per hectare. Now, when we map that, you can see that very clearly. We looked at, this is across the, the major cities where we looked at these figures, Melbourne, Sydney, Perth and Brisbane. And you see a similar pattern to what we saw with walkability, not surprisingly, because walkability has density as one of the measures. But you can see, again, in the inner city, you're starting to get up to the higher levels of density but not very high, but nevertheless higher. Out in the fringe, really high, low density, five to, dwell, five to 10 dwellings per hectare out here. Uh, you see the similar pattern in Perth, Brisbane the same. Sydney has more density, and you can see down in the south of Sydney, you see the sort of levels of density in a little pocket out here, probably Liverpool or Parramatta. But again, you can see a lot of areas where the densities are too low. Now this is really important because if you wanna have a walkable city, places where people can walk and cycle to, uh, there needs to be destinations. And if, unless the densities are high enough, you won't get it. Now, when we look at the where in this, these cities is this, are these policies being delivered? So this is actually saying, well, this is the target, 15 dwellings per hectare. Which suburbs are actually achieving that? You can see exactly what I described to you. These are the only suburbs where there was a significant number of people with this sort of levels of oh, an average density of 15 dwellings per hectare. Most of the rest of the city is not going to ever be walkable because it's very hard to achieve a walkable environment if you don't have access. The densities aren't higher. We found about 25 to 30 dwellings per hectare actually in our research. So you can see it's quite problematic. For Melbourne, for example, 27% of people live and work in the same area. Okay, not everyone just in, but even in the outer suburban areas. And quite a lot of people live and work in the area in the outer suburban areas. But very few of them walk or cycle to get there. They will drive. So culturally, we are, you know, and we haven't got a safe cycling environment. So culturally and practically, we haven't designed, we're not even thinking that an alternative would be in even the outer suburban areas is to use an alternative. So that's a lot of people who could potentially use an alternative, particularly my, we, we did a report a few years ago for Australian Council of Learned Academies and we had it in there was included some maps which showed what it would look like in Melbourne and Sydney if we put um, cycle paths within five kilometres of all the train stations. Now, if you also did that for all the activity centres across cities, you'd be amazed how much of the city is connected by doing that. We made a number of recommendations out of this report. First of all, we argued that there needed to be evidence-informed policies, that there's a lot of evidence now about how we could create healthy, livable cities, and we needed to be using evidence to inform our policies. We suggested that there needed to be short, medium, and long-term targets. It's very hard to turn the ship around when we've got the challenges that we have in our cities. But if we want to do that, we need to be ambitious in our targets. We suggested that people go for higher targets, but they have short and medium long-term targets to achieve these bigger goals. We suggested that the spatial indicators are very useful in actually seeing benchmarking and monitoring cities so we can actually see what we're delivering on the ground for the people who we're trying to serve with our policies. And we suggested that if we really want to change our cities, we need metropolitan governance because one of the challenges in terms of delivering these sorts of cities is that we need integration across all the different sectors, both vertically, federal government, state government, 
and local government, but importantly, also horizontally across all the different government departments, you know, land use, transport, education, they all need to be working together to deliver the cities we need. So we need metropolitan governance. And the report, to be honest, has been very well received. People in planning have really, even though we're public health academics, have really found it a useful piece of work. Well, I think we all need sticks and carrots. I think it's the combination of things that's required. It's, it's difficult to say to people, well, you, will put, you, have to tr you have to use an alternative when the alternative is not a safe alternative, for example, or the public transport system is not supporting people to make that transition. The way I think about the way we build our cities and all of, even providing cycle paths, it's a necessary but insufficient cause of change. You've got to provide it, and over time people will change. It's not going to happen overnight. The transition is not going to happen overnight. But if we really want people to change, it's no point bringing in the regulation and, and this is an alternative. And I think that's where the policy and the implementation of the policy, it's not just having policy. Our research shows that we have policies and they're not actually being delivered. And so you have to have the combination, good policy, well implemented, uh, and then, you know, maybe the sticks come in a little bit later. At some point we're going to have to get to sticks because, you know, you need to have some mandating. Like density I think is one where I think we probably need to get to the point where we we just can't continue to just build out of suburban housing like we are. But, you know, that's, it takes a brave government. And we've got to see good products coming on the market that provides people with a vision about what's possible. Particularly if we could have a showcase of, you know, a Fitzroy or a, a really cool place in the outer suburban areas that we could actually deliver, you know, the sort of urban development in the outer suburban areas where it really became a hip place to live, then I think people would be attracted to it because they can see the they can see the alternative. They can see and we've done some research that shows that most people, like sixty seven percent of people would rather live in a suburb where they could walk and cycle to local destinations, so like shops and services. So I think there's a latent demand for it, but it has to be delivered well. And I don't think that we're delivering well at the moment. Now, we didn't stop there. We wanted to get the work out. So we've done a number of things. We've tried to influence policy. We tried to make sense of the evidence. We put out scorecards for all the cities where we've done policy analysis. We've created an observatory, the Australian Urban Observatory, which is headed up by Mel Davin. She is the director of that, and it tries to take all the data off our computers and gives it back so that people can use it to benchmark and monitor, and it can be used by local government to actually look at what's going on at the local government area level. So it's a way of us giving back to the communities who we've been trying to study. And we've done this not just for the capital cities now, but we've done it for the 21 cities that are the largest cities in Australia, that, which are in the federal government's um, national performance framework. These are all the cities, 21, where about 80 to 86% of people live in Australia. So very good coverage across, across the country. We tried to, you know, I showed you all the research that we did, all the sort of the scientific endeavor that we created. Well, we wanted to summarize that and, and create some metrics that would create a healthy livable community. So we've created the urban livability checklist, which can be used by local government to say, well, you know, is this development going to achieve the outcomes that we want? It's interesting to think whether our work will ever inf influence the economists to think, rethink its urban livability checklist, mainly because the purpose of that index is to decide whether or not executives who are global globetrotters are going to get a loading. Our index is really focused on what's the lived experience of people living in the city, whereas this is trying to give a clue to organisations about what they should give as a bonus to their staff who were relocating. So it would be nice to think that they would think more broadly about people who live in the city rather than the, the, the people who are going to fly in from somewhere else. But it's not clear to me that that's what this is about. And particularly because it's an overall index, what they do is they have a measure for the overall index. Ours is spatial, so you can actually see the spatial distribution of policies within a city and you can see the winners and the losers. Um, to me, that's very powerful. And it ties to the World Health Organization. They talk about hidden cities, that our job should be to identify inequalities in our cities. And that's really, I suppose, inspired and guided 
the way I've been thinking about our work um, is to see whether we could identify the winners and losers in a city. And I don't know that, that the Economist Intelligence Unit is particularly interested in that, um, even though it, it would be a nice alternative that they could do is the livability for people who already live there rather than the people flying in. We work with the Heart Foundation, so the idea of working with external advocates. The Heart Foundation has Healthy Active by Design. We did all the literature reviews for all of its domains. It's interested in public open space, access to community facilities. We did all the literature reviews on what's the evidence telling us about how we can achieve that. This is used by planners and urban designers. And we also work with the Planning Institute of Australia, important external advocates for our work. We didn't stop there. We've responded to submissions. We've put in, so any time there's a you know, call for submissions, we used our evidence to be able to put our point about using evidence um, and all the recommendations that we made in that report, we've actually incorporated into, into all of our submissions to government whenever there's a call for submissions. So is anyone listening? You know, we're, we're academics, we're not policymakers. We've tried to do research that is both scientifically interesting and but also relevant to policy, so relevant to both. Uh, are we having any impact? Yes, I think we are. I think we've had a, a lot of impact for a small group. So we've had policy impact in the state government. So we were invited to participate in Plan Melbourne, which was written in 2014. Um, and you can see livable uh, communities and neighbourhoods, creating neighbourhoods that support safe communities and healthy lifestyles. We actually wrote um, some of the sections which were to do with health and wellbeing. So that was exciting to have that opportunity. Our definition of livability uh, appears in the Victorian uh, Public Health and Wellbeing Plan, both the early plan 2015 to 19 and the more recent plan 2020 to 23 includes our definition of livability. And that's important because in Victoria, at least, the local government needs to look to the state health and wellbeing plan to set up its municipal plans. And we have our definition of livability in there. Clearly, the state government thinks it's important. Our research has contributed to the concept of the 20-minute neighbourhood. We were thrilled to see that it's been picked up by the state government uh, in conceptualising what is the 20-minute neighbourhood, which is the latest policy push to achieve the cities that we're trying to advocate here. But they've, they've used our metrics, some of the things that we have in our urban livability checklist, to come up with what is the evidence about what size neighbourhood are we talking about. They've actually recommended uh, our livability scorecards and, and, and suggested that our livability framework might be something that they can use to evaluate Plan Melbourne. So we were pleased about that, and it may or may not be used, but nevertheless, there's a, a nod that this is relevant. We've influenced local government policy, so various councils are using our livability indicators to inform their work, so Cardinia, Moreland, uh, the Interface Councils, Mornington Peninsula have all used our indicators, many more councils actually, have used our indicators to inform their health and wellbeing plans through their municipal planning, so we're pleased about that. We've had influence at the federal level. So uh, the federal government has a national performance framework and we've been able to and been invited to provide indicators that have gone into its performance framework. So for cities, we've provided the, our public transport indicator, which not only considers people having access, it, but how frequent our services, which we have found to be associated with health. A public open space indicator, which is not only that people have access to public open space, that it's a certain size because we found that that is more important. There's lots of very small pocket parks that don't seem to promote health and well-being, um, but we our indicators in there. Our social infrastructure indicator, which we found is associated with people's mental health and well-being and certainly provides um, destinations to people to walk to, and our walkability index, which we know is associated with people walking, cycling, and um, using public transport and less likely to drive. So these are evidence-based policy uh, indicators that have gone into the federal government's uh, framework. So when we think about pocket parks, one of the biggest challenges is that um, there's lots of them. And we've done some research that's compared um, looking at trying to predict people walking by access to parks, and we found in Melbourne that we didn't find any associations between living within 400 metres of a public open space. That's the policy here, that people should live within 400 metres of a public open space. Now, when we did that same study in Perth, we found an association. And I'm thinking, well, this is very strange. And then when you look at, dig deeper, you look into the types of parks that are being developed in Melbourne, you see a disproportionate number of the parks are little pocket parks, small parks. Whereas in Perth, there's a disproportionate number, well, compared to Melbourne at least, 
of larger parks. So then what we started to do was say, well, okay, well, what if in Melbourne, we ha what's, what's the relationship between walking for recreation and having access to a larger park? So we found that in Melbourne, if the park was one and a half hectares and within 400 metres of people's homes, they were more likely to walk. So our recommendation is that we need to have fewer but larger parks rather than lots of little pocket parks. But there is one proviso here, and that's really important, I think, is that with climate change and heat island effects, we also need to be thinking about making sure that people have greenery, tree canopy in local areas because the heat island effects that are coming from the way we're building our cities, you know, the accumulation from all the sort of tarmac and the roofs and that sort of thing is really critical. So as we densify our cities, we need to be thinking about how we can increase tree canopy and potentially, and I haven't looked at this at all, but potentially small parks might pay a park there, provided they had tree, they had trees on them, not just, just grass. So I think, you know, there's some, you know, there's some subtleties there, but our research has not showed that lots of little pocket parks is a good investment from a health point of view. So is any of this important? Well, from a health point of view, it's very important. And um, this is interesting work from the Heart Foundation, where they've looked at standardised mortality ratios of the lowest socioeconomic LGAs compared to the highest. And you see this incredible gradient that the areas with the lowest socioeconomic status have much higher heart attack rates in Melbourne. This is old data, but still probably just as relevant now as it was then, and compared to the more advantaged LGAs. So from a health point of view, the sorts of risk factors where I'm talking about walking, cycling, using public transport and, and having more physical activity is clearly really important for cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes. So we see these patterns. So there are incredible gradients in people's health and we would argue that the, the environment in which people live contribute to that. But of course, the biggest threat to human health we now recognise is climate change. And the sorts of things that we're talking about in terms of the way we design cities for chronic disease, health and well-being, is also really important because it'll get people out of cars, walking, cycling and using public transport as an alternative. Sustainable mobility is the term that's commonly used. The Lancet Commission came out and said in 2020 that climate change is the greatest global health threat facing the world in the 21st century. I know COVID seems very urgent and it is, but it's acute. This is chronic and the solutions require a, a shift in the way we're building our cities as the contributor um, to uh, reducing emissions. I think the Lancet series was really wise in, in promoting this because it also said that the greatest opportunity to redefine the social and environmental determinants of health are through our actions on climate change. So there's a really important opportunity here it's a climate emergency. We've seen it. We have a visceral response when we see what's been going on in our weather patterns. It's official. Uh, our, war our climate is warming. It's hard to argue with those data. It's quite alarming when we see the temperatures that we've been seeing over the last few years. You have a visceral response when you see, uh, this is in 2019, um, the nightmare from the 2000 flying foxes that perished during the Victorian heat wave. And then, of course, we had the fires uh, and the massive um, biodiversity loss and the fire and destruction that we saw in 2025. So we have a visceral response to this. We really need to have action. And of course, in cities, we were affected as well. This is my, from my balcony in Fitzroy looking over the city. This was the air research that came out on that. And during the 2020 bushfires, the PM 2.5 levels of, that we were seeing in Sydney were classified as hazardous. Um, by the World Health Organization, and we were, we were told that in, in Victoria as well, then Melbourne, alarming. Air pollution globally kills about 4.2 million people every year due to stroke, heart disease, lung cancer, acute chronic respiratory diseases. And in Australia, we, it kills about 3,000 per year. So if we're seeing more fires which are affecting people in cities, we can expect these figures to rise. So these are alarming figures, so we need, to, we need some action. The World Health Organization actually put out a report last year talking about this idea of bringing together all these agendas, the chronic disease agendas with the climate change agenda, health, environment and climate change and the transformations that are needed to shift us from where we are now to where we're going to be able to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And clearly the way we design our cities is critical. So in terms of coming back to the original question that I started with this talk, livable cities for all, are we there yet? I think we can firmly say that we have a way to go.
And this is important because not only is it affecting chronic disease, but also with uh, climate change, it will affect our health, all of our health, the ecosystem health into the future. I like to sort of reflect on this because this is not a dress rehearsal. On our watch, our cities are growing, demands for infrastructure are growing. Cities contribute already to 75% of greenhouse gas emissions and 24% of them are transport related. And we are harming habitats of animals and our ecosystems. The planet's warming, we're losing biodiversity and the health and well-being of people, the ecosystem and the planet is being affected partly by the way we're building our cities. So we have a lot to answer for. And when I look at young people and I see them putting pressure and wanting change, I mean, it's hard to argue as a senior person, academic, I've tried to dedicate my life to this, but it's still a big challenge to actually shift policy, but we need to shift. And I like to end on a humorous note. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this cartoon, you know, what if we're wrong? What if climate change doesn't exist? I don't believe that, but what if it doesn't? We're going to have energy independence, we're going to preserve our forests, we're going to have sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewable, clean water, healthy children. It's got to be good. What if it's a hoax? We're just going to create a better world. Is that going to be for nothing? I think we've got our young people to think about. It's really important and I hope that we can have some discussion about what we can do individually and as a community to actually change policies that will create the cities that we know we need uh, and we, most of us want. So I think there's a great opportunity. One thing I'd like people to take away from what I've talked about today is that this isn't a dress rehearsal. You know, I, my, my closing slides show that there's lots of really big things happening in our cities across the globe, including in Melbourne where I live. Cities are a major emitter of emissions and transport is a huge contributor to that. We need to do things differently. We really need to do things differently. We cannot continue to put our hands over our eyes and say, well, you know, it, it, we can continue to live just as we always have. Sustainable mobility is a really important contributor to reducing emissions. Um, it's good for people's health and well-being. Uh, it's good for people's and it's good for the environment. And continued growth is affecting our ecosystems as well. So I think for me... I mean, climate change is the biggest threat to human health. The work I've been doing is focused on chronic disease, but it ties really beautifully to an agenda around uh, mitigating and adapting to climate change. So I think if anyone was going to take a message from this, it's not a dress rehearsal. We all need to change, and that's not easy. And what if we're wrong? Maybe it's not going to be that bad, but what's the alternative? When we, we look at what we're going to produce, we're going to produce a healthier, more sustainable environment we're going to use less resources. It's going to be a positive thing anyway. Um, but I think more importantly, what if all the science is right? Do we want that on our head? And I don't think that we do. So to me, please, the one message is we all need to change and that's not easy, um, but it's something that we all need to do. And I think what we're trying to do is to provide the metrics to help what we need to do in our cities and... Um, I think it would be great if we could policymakers picked up and were able to contribute, but they'll only do what the public want. So I think go and speak to your politician. You know, this is important stuff.